It looks like just a few other people are coming in right now. Oh, I recognize <laughs> some people. There are some recognizable names. That's always good. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to, to first uh, start out and thank everyone for joining us here today. Um, this is the Food for Thought Lecture Series at the uh, Faculty of Architecture. Um, I'm Jason Shields, an assistant professor with the Department of Interior Design. And today we have a special guest. And I just wanted to note this was actually a guest that was requested by the student body. And so uh, we were able to reach out to Debbie and I'm, I'm really excited to have her here today. First and foremost, though, I just wanted to make some traditional territory acknowledgements. So the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, OG Cree, Dakota, and Dene people, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, we respect the treaties that were made on these territories, and we acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And so today we have Debbie Golub. Um, she is with Design Shop, formerly known as, I think, Design Shop Girls. And well, so, Design wow. Shop, and people lovingly called us that. It just sort of ran with it. But See, always, always incorporated the Design Shop. <laughs> and so we have uh, two members of their team here today. First and foremost, we have Debbie. And Debbie is a passionate interior designer, brand maker, and environmental behavioralist. Debbie has always done things differently, starting her education with a degree in psychology before continuing on in design. Prior to co-founding Design Shop, she was mentored in high-end residential interiors, commercial and corporate design, as well as retail and brand design, but not before taking the time to see the world, exploring her curiosity for world culture and carrying those experiences back with her and, exper and expressing these values in her work. We should also note that Debbie is one of two business partners. Um, the other business partner, Amanda Manuk, is not here today, but she has brought with her um, a former uh, graduate of the Department of Interior Design and a former student that I myself worked with, uh, David Gutt. And David Gutt is a junior interior design designer and a recent graduate of the Environmental Design Program. He joined Design Shop following his graduation in 2020 and has since had his hands in a number of projects at various stages from concept to completion. This includes residential and commercial projects on a local uh, basis, as well as a handful of projects across Canada and locations such as Lethbridge and Lake of the Woods. And that's about all I have to say for my introduction. So I'm going to hand things over to Debbie and David. Woohoo! Thanks for the intro. So a little precursor for me is that I tend to go in tangents. So thank you for your patience in advance. And Dave is going to be giving me nudges through the process and likely switching a slide ahead. So I stay on track because that's just kind of how I roll, but it's also on brand. So David is going to take us to slide one. Um, all right. So something that really resonates with us. I don't know where I'm going from here, but I promise it won't be boring. So that was something when Amanda and I sort of started off, um, we were deep diving into what we wanted for our life. And that's sort of how Design Shop evolved. It was like stemming from what we wanted to have in our, in our lives. Um, so this is Amanda and myself, a little bit about our background. So as Jason mentioned, I have a BA in psychology. I have a BNVD, which actually was interior design education, but I switched over after three years and graduated with the ED. I went into my MID, I studied for two years and threw it in the garbage. So I'm a little bit of a dark horse, I guess you can say. Um, I come from a lot of mentorship in design. So I worked with EQ3 for three years doing store design and branding, uh, grant design group where I focus on commercial design, uh, mainly corporate commercial. So three years there, I did some work at Red River for teaching and their decorating courses and then high end residential with Fenwick and Company for three years as well. And then design shop since 2013. So lots of um, Expert, like lots of experience and lots of background to bring to the table. And Amanda herself, she's with, well, read it. She's now a member of Pitham Provincial. She's got her BNV, BNVD. And we actually met at Grant Design Group. So that's where we started to connect and uh, blossom our little story. And then she followed me to Fenwick and Company and then again, Design Shop. So uh, something that's huge about Amanda and I, why we, decided to form together. We have an amazing collaborative chemistry, amazing communication, strong trust bonds. We're each other's yin to the yang. She's more the yin, I'm the yang. 
Um, we always describe ourselves as more of a sister's type of relationship and she's my partner in crime. So now we'll show you who the team is. So as of yesterday, the team grew, to be honest. So if we go from right going to left, we have our new introduction is Kristen Trafiak. So she joined us just yesterday, super excited. Mike Page, also BA, um, a BA in Bachelor of Environmental Design. David, who we already, there he is again, <laughs> said hi. Esther, who I think has joined us. Um, she comes with a BA and an IDD, and then Natasha, who recently got her NCIDQ. She's actually on mat leave, but still a huge member of our team. And then Mel Dupuis, who I went to school with. So chemistry and designing together for 23 years. And hi, Esther, back. <laughs> and getting little notes. So that's our crew. It's pretty big now. I just realized that. <laughs> okay, so some of the work that we do is new home design, show homes, renovations and additions, condos, lofts, summer homes we're getting a lot into as well. Um, so the services we offer as a firm is site analysis and measurements and documentation, programming, we're pretty intense with that, space planning we love, um, design development and visualization, clearly we're addicted to that too. Um, working in permits at drawings, we do class A drawings for tenders, custom millwork and detailing, Again, also obsessed with. Um, and then during the build out, we help with design and construction management. And then for commercial spaces, we'll get into this a bit more, but we kind of, uh, we tend to swing and I'll explain that a little bit later, but we have a lot of corporate office under our belt, wellness and clinic spaces, hospitalities and restaurants and retail. So again, be prior to being design shop, every single person on our team comes from a lot of experience and mentorship in the field. So, some things you might know us from for medical aesthetics, which is a bit of a bougie medical clinic. And we did this project from conception to completion in a record breaking 11 months. Um, business plan was being built laterally by the client as we designed. So that was ambitious. Well, got a few gray hairs after that one. And then the next project you may know us um, from is Ubisoft, so that one was bonkers. Uh, this one was a crazy project. You had to be, originally you were invited to bid on it and so we weren't on the radar. Um, and then they just felt like they needed um, a new spirit and sought us out. So we went through the whole um, interview process. We put a portfolio together, we got shortlisted, won the project, which um, was amazing, got flown down to Montreal. And within a week, we were deep diving and trying to do their first, um, we call it the pop-up shop, the first layer of Ubisoft. We had to design and build that within three months. And then they didn't know if they were staying at, in Winnipeg or if that was just like a temporary space. Anyways, they've stayed. They've been in the news rate recently because they're adding more people to their team. And this is what we produced or a snapshot of what we produced in their highly conceptual studio. So and that's me in the top right corner. Um, just a floor plan to take a look at it. So there's some very utilitarian spaces in terms of functional and lots of conceptual zones. Um, so that was a fun little guy. Sweet Impressions that just recently opened on Corden. Go check it out. I bought a cookie from there yesterday. So um, yeah, this would be like one of our restaurant style spaces. So you can see we went from medical to um, studio office to restaurant here. And then next, uh, we've been recently posting a lot because we're kind of obsessed with the space. <laughs> uh, but this was a mid-century modern home that we had the privilege of renovating um, on Brock Street. And so, yeah, here's a few snapshots from that. We basically blast all over social. So you'll see that there as well if you don't follow us on Instagram. And then just floor plans for that. So. Um, I know you guys, the students, so first of all, I should acknowledge that. Thank you for having us down. Thanks for requesting Design Shop. Um, we love the fact that you want to learn about our business, and that's what we're presenting to you about who we are, how we did it, how we got there. Um, and it's just re really exciting to know that we excite you and give you hope and inspiration to build your own business. So hopefully this presentation 
will give you some tools and some courage to do your next steps. Okay, so this is how do I read this? So it all started with like our brand story. So when Amanda and I started, um, we wanted to be authentically us. I think the key core to everything we do is we've literally gone down to the root of who we are as human beings. Um, so it didn't always look as good as it did, and we'll show you some of those cringeworthy moments later on. But at the end of the day, the essence of our um, uh, humanness was in it, and Design Shop grew from who we were as people, and we aligned ourselves with partners and um, clients and staff who stayed with us for a long time based on that. So founded by me and Amanda, blah, blah, blah. Um, we wanted to just have a bit of a twist on just sort of the narrative traditional interior design those boundaries. So since the beginning, we've always done things differently. And I think we quickly made a name for ourselves in the Winnipeg design scene because of just felt like a bit of a rigor. Um, so while our team has been cognizant of the theories of our work, our passion is in the art of interior design and providing white glove service to each of our clients. So as quirky as we may be, and as like, yeah, I mean, it's just quirky, that's just how we roll. At the end of the day, there is an intelligence, there is an experience base, and we offer that white glove service. So that's one of those things that uh, regardless how loosey-goosey we can be, um, it comes back to that. Um, so, and our team, they are the center of our business. So we have like, basically we've had designers that some of them have come and gone, but our core group has always been the same. So we've been together for essentially nine years, me, Amanda, obviously, Mel and Natasha, um, even like our group, Esther applied for us years ago, but at the time she didn't have enough experience, but she kept us us on her radar and us her, and now she's part of her team, which is great. Um, so, and then we've had Mike and Kristen, like I mentioned, and David, and everyone comes with like special strengths and history together, which is beautiful. Um, so the team is a core of our centers. And one thing that we really want, that was part of our brand story also, is we really want to find a way to communicate our unique presence and, as both risk takers, um, and we say rebels, but it's just, we just do us, right? Um, while maintaining a high level of professionalism and the ability to project manage, we often are primes in our projects. And uh, with that, we will manage our local architects, the builders, engineers. Um, and it's always important for us to make sure each and every one of our clients, regardless of the scope of work, feel valued and heard. So that was the brand. So now going into our core values. So again, while you're building your story of who you are, you have to deconstruct your brand identity, your core values. All of that gets filtered into everything you do. So when we broke down what our core values are, um, it gave us a direction and a purpose to create that business and brand. So wherever our business exists, whether it's in a store, which we're not, or on a website or on social media, the core value should always define how you operate and what you do. So we always like to say that when clients hire us, if they've been following us on social, they know exactly what they're getting. It's not a show, it's not posturing, it's literally who we are as people. So there's transparency there. Um, and our purpose, for our, in our core values is always to tell the story of our clients that we work with. So we always want to do that in a unique and strategic way through interior design. Um, obviously, there can be some designers where it's my way or the highway or they have their own agenda. You know, and some of it is important, but at the end of the day, and here comes my cat, <laughs> our projects need to be meaningful, um, not just for our portfolio, but most importantly for the people who live in those spaces um, and who want to have those spaces support their lifestyles and family or if it's a business, support that. So that is critical. Um, so we strive to be, we strive to be really our, upfront, artistic and professional in our approach when we're helping people discover um, how their space is planned, details and styled. So when we're designing too, you know, you come up with a concept strategy. I always sort of compare it to you're writing a paper or you're writing your thesis if you're a master's and your claim, your claim is critical. 
And every gesture you do, every decision you make has to go through that filter. And that way you have either a, a deliberately juxtaposed narrative or point of view, or you have consistent messaging, but that is critical. So it goes down into planning, into detailing, into styling, all those layers go through the filter. Um, and then as stated as our web, on our website, we're not dogmatic, we're not snobby, and we don't keep our own, we don't keep an agenda. So we always work in pairs, we're collaborative. We love the fact that we have a generational shift in our business. Um, Mel and I always laugh that we're the oldies, the goodies, and Mike's now part of that team. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> and the other ones are the young, and it seems like the oldies, the goodies are a little bit more <laughs> obnoxious. Um, and one thing, and another thing that's really important to us is that we like to feel that we're adaptable. We read the room, we're very approachable, and we listen actively. So it's not just hearing, it's listen actively. Um, we found that like design as a whole, when we were doing our analysis and we'll get bit, a bit more into business plan, the perception of it was it's snobby, it's pretentious, people feel intimidated. So we wanted to break down those barriers and it's not like it was deliberate per se, that's just who we are and that's who we attract. Um, so with this philosophy and um, core values in mind, every campaign or piece of content that we create is giving a glimpse into our team, our personalities, and that background. So then we had to define from a business, who is our audience? Like, you can't just be like, oh, I want everyone, I'll take every job in the world. So um, no, we had to define who that was because the success of our projects is based on the success of clients and how they want to deliver information, our chemistry, and that's ultimately how you enjoy what you do every day because it's hard. Um, and ultimately how we pair with people that um, we can get the best out of. So we value our relationships and understanding the overall process. Um, and they're on board for the collaborative experience of working with us and our team. So we're only as good as what they want to offer. So it's our job to be able to prompt create a safe place for them to land and want to engage. So if we break down, and again, we don't do it with consciousness, it's just who we are. If we provide a platform that's very softer, more approachable, um, more human, we're gonna have better dialogue. So how can we make their lives better? So that's another thing when we look at our audience. We can help clear, uh, we need to clear away some of the confusion and noise of traditional design studios. And that again goes into what we define, some of the pretentiousness. Um, so we still offer with our softer approach um, and quirky, a highly experienced team um, and experts who will listen and genuinely want to help our clients' visions come to life. So we're the experts on how to edit. They're the experts on their life or business. And together we marry it and come up with the products. Um, okay, so then solutions and ideas. Um, so we offer overall direction throughout the design and build process while keeping them informed the whole, whole time. Managing expectations, that is huge. Like what people get nervous about is the unknown. So we give a why to everything. We try to, Construction's not easy, it's a process and stuff's gonna happen. So for example, we're in COVID, <laughs> we can't control containers, <laughs> we can't control X, Y, Z. And I, ultimately clients are the ones who are choosing to build or go through this process during a very unpredictable time. But it is our job to constantly keep clients informed, up to date and feel a little bit safer in their process and just be there to support them as things shifts. And that's pre-COVID and COVID, manage expectations. Um, and then while doing this, like with our audiences, we always wanna provide a relatable, <laughs> uh, a relational, uh, enjoyable experience throughout. So no stuffy formal meetings. We're sometimes on the floor, drinking a beer, having coffee and we meet them to the level. So again, reading the room, um, and adapting, not our personalities, but just adjusting the tone, but uh, meeting them at their level. So some of the challenges and goals, so we obviously, Amanda and I like bulldoze into design shop. Um, again, we'll, we'll sort of backtrack into some of the details of where we started, but some of the challenges when we did like a wash over of who we are, because we have evolved, that we noticed is that 
our name could imply immaturity or frivol uh, frivolity. So the goal when we did some rebranding was to establish our name as Design Shop with a clear message of what we stand for and when it comes to interior design and working as a team of experienced designers. So we start to talk a little bit more in our social and just through blogs and platforms like this um, and entering competitions and winning them um, that we are experienced. So again, none, no one on our team is green. David's new to us. <laughs> but he's a bit of a <laughs> unicorn and we're pro hopefully providing him with a lot of mentorship over here, but uh, everyone comes from working either architectural firms or six to nine years of experience prior to coming to design shop. So it's, it's not just like, Hey, I'm out of school. I have a knack. I'm going to do this. There's a lot of groundwork that we did to be responsible. Um, another challenge we had as originally, people were confused what we were offering as branding as a graphic design service. Um, and that's because we talked about branding a lot. So we had to clarify what that looked like. And again, we'll get into that. Um, and then the goal was to be able to explain and define our commitment to interior design and what our name really meant uh, for both businesses and individuals. And so the communicate and one of our communication challenges is we don't have a physical shop or an office. We are home based. So right now we're in my house and we always have been and we likely always will be. So our storefront looks a little bit different. It's more on the virtual social end. OK, so then again too. Going through your business, what's your messaging? We deconstructed um, some brand keywords that identified who we are. So to the left is what def defines us and to the right is what they don't. So we are fun and playful, yeah. We are empathetic, for sure. Um, adaptable, we've talked about that. Approachable, and we're big advocators. We're advocators for our team internally, like our team is our family. And it doesn't mean you ignore things that are wrong, but we advocate and make sure everyone feels safe and they're part of that home. And then we advocate for our clients. So drawings, we do very detailed drawings. The more you have on them, and again, I'll get into that more, but the more you have on them, the more you protect the intent of the project and the more you protect the investment of the client. So that's a tool of advocacy. So if we're on site, which we are a lot, and we see a wall in the wrong place, it's coming down. We're advocating for the client. You know, there are some conversations that take place that sometimes these mistakes turn into wonderful things. So those dialogues happen. But ultimately, our drawings, we've been hired by the client, we need to advocate for that in a respectful way. And adjectives that do not describe a brand, juvenile, pretentious, flippant, formal, trendy. Um, and then brand key messages. Um, so we work with people, how they behave and interact. Like I actually like to describe myself and it's partially because of my psychology background and I feel like I'm very somatically aware. Um, the way people behave and interact with their spaces and how spaces can control and mediate your behaviors and experience is very important to us. So we can incorporate that feeling and experience and knowing into our designs as well. And we merge that um, in a way that we can tell each person's uh, business or story or their business plan. Um, we don't really play by the book. Um, we're professional and we're experienced and it allows us to know which rules to break. Um, so we kind of, there's always that tipping point in the fine line. I think we like to dip our toe in OAC, but we do our due diligence. We're always doing our due diligence legally, checking with PITM, um, you know, but stretching the rules when I think we can. Um, maybe I shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsies, Design Shop is a really, like I said, educated, experienced, professional team. So we don't really have to go back into that. Um, Design Shop has been doing this for years and we can help you through every step of the way. So that's when we also want clients to know is full service, beginning to end. So if you're a business owner, you're working on your business plan, often that business plan is loosey-goosey. We'll even give you information to start building into it, whether it's through your site investigation, your leaseholds, um, negotiating that, how long it's going to take for the build out, 
we offer that support and from the conception of a project right down to design management. And uh, we help with progress payments, we help with contract admin. Um, so it's a, it's a full scope project. And then sometimes depending on the project, we do the styling too. So again, when we're talking about that edit of a concept, um, we wanted to go through the minutia. Uh, design shop cares about community, collaboration and working as a team. So again, we reject pretentiousness and posturing and we're opting more for an attitude of collaboration and compassion. And we ask for that for our team within and with our clients. Like we are who we are. Um, so those are kind of things we, we reject and the community at large, we work a lot with our community. Um, I feel like we've been part of building our city in some capacity with all the projects we've worked on. I don't want to take that much responsibility, but it is fun to see your projects pop up and know that you're touching people's hearts um, at different scales. Okay, so beginnings. This is 2013. So Amanda and I, before we, our faces doubled in size. <laughs> So love pink, it's who we are. So grassroots, we just had an idea. I always knew I was gonna be a business owner. It was like, I think it's just in my DNA from how it was brought up. So that was something I always knew. And it was something I was transparent with every employer that I had. So every place I worked, I was like, one day I'm gonna own my own business. I'm open to um, a contingency, not a contingency plan. What is it? When you take over a business from someone else. So values aligned. I was on board for that or starting my own. So um, for myself, I've been doing my due diligence from EQ3 of corporate commercial and working with brand and franchise to again, like the grant design group role, Fenwick. So three years of each before design shop. Amanda and I were at grant design group together. So that's where we met. Fenwick, I've mentioned that. And Natasha was also with us at grant design group. Um, so our startup, like, it was my kitchen table. It, we had two laptops, two licenses, just a little bit of entrepreneurial savviness, drive, gusto, and passion. Um, it's kind of what we had. Then we had our corporate office. We see that it's been my house from day one. Um, so it was kitchen table, local Starbucks and lounges, and our cats. So you didn't need a lot to start with. We just needed to have some ideas and start building strategy. Um, and then we got to introduce, there's resources out there if you're wanting to start your own business. And um, the nature of how Amanda and I, um, or how, why we decided to collaborate, we were both on leave for different reasons. My ex-partner had a heart attack. <laughs> so that was something. And Amanda was um, just got diagnosed with celiac. So we were both kind of going through some shifts and decided, you know what, this is the right time. And because of that nature, there were certain programs that were available to us at the time. And of course we were doing digging. So this is something to be on the lookout. Um, There's a program called the Self-Employment Program. It was through the Y um, and it was amazing. And basically what they did, you had to apply for it. And Amanda and I were the first duo to do it. Usually it's uh, sole proprietors. And you have to pitch your idea. And like now in retrospect, I'm like, why were we so revolutionary? But I think it was our attitude is that we wanted to just be that refreshing voice. And maybe they wanted to take a chance in a duo. So we got, we got accepted. And the way the program works, and again, look up for the stuff they exist, is they basically brought us on and paid us to learn a little bit about business. So we each received, um, it was like the max amount that you get for unemployment each month. And you got that full amount provided everything you did energy wise went towards building your business. If you were working on the side as a server or you know whatever you were doing and you were profiting from that, that would come off that bottom line. If you're working on your business and start to build from your business financially, that just got topped on top of it. So you would get the self-employment salary and then whatever you made on there. So the, the goal was to get you up and running. Um, it was amazing too. And so that lasted for 10 months. And then for the last two months, and I might be making up the timeline, they paid you a lower amount because you would have had like a good intro into your business. So they provided intro courses, like some were really boring. I hate Excel, you know, intro to accounting, blah, 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 uh, marketing. So just a bunch of little mini pockets. So you, you knew 
who to engage with your business. You understand the, the broad brushstrokes and, or you could do some of those tasks on your own. Um, and then they also gave us, I just got to check the time, assigned us a business coach. And so that business coach basically would help us um, make our business plan. So we actually, Amanda and I wrote a 200 page business plan at first. And that was bonkers. And we'll show you a little bit of a line of what we had to tackle and we had to get it down to 50 pages. So our business coach helped us with that. And then we would meet with him every two weeks and go through a list of everything that we did as um, towards our business. And so it kept you in line and it kept you on track and they gave us active feedback. And then there's grants up there, you guys, like check them out. Uh, I was too old, but Amanda was just at the tipping point where we were able to get a grant for, um, oh my gosh, it was like 26 and under. I can't remember how they labeled them. Um, and then we were a female led company. So there was a lot of grants towards, um, you know, female entrepreneurs. So that was great. And then the other tip we had is like lean into your professionals. Like, legal, get yourself incorporated or whatever or whatever framework you want to do. I was very fortunate. My dad owned a law firm. So everything I do too, when I talk about breaking rules, like I basically have checked every box, crossed every T, dotted every I in terms of legal. Um, we have a great accountant, um, we have a bookkeeper, and then later on in the game, we brought on a marketing strategist. So Amanda and I built our business plan at Starbucks. Part of it was strategic too. It was interesting because we would go to our local where the, we knew people from our community um, would be lingering and everyone was starting engaging and talking. So even when we talked about strategic planning about how we expressed our brand, just as being there, people were curious, chatted, and then they wanted to support us. So building our business plan or working on our projects and doing drawings or meeting with clients became a marketing tool of people like, Deb, Amanda, what are you up to? This is good for you. Okay. So yeah, that was a bit of a side note, but that was also strategic on our part. And that's why we kept home base because that kind of visibility and going out, A, it's nice for us not to be stuck at an office, that's on our personalities, but it also was a touch point. Um, there's different ways to uh, communicate with your audience. Um, so our business plan is really comprehensive and I honestly think it's what was the key to making us stay on track and get through COVID. So we really went through our goals and objectives. We did market research. Um, we had a marketing plan. We had operational organization and management. We did a risk assessment and management and financial strategy. So I would say risk assessment and management was huge, especially during COVID. Um, yeah, like we had three babies I had cancer, we had a pandemic. We now have the biggest jobs of our life. Um, it's been wild. So had we not had going through that big risk of management, I think we would not be handling it with as much grace as we are right now. I hope we're handling it with grace. So do a business plan. Oh my gosh. <laughs> These are the earlier days for marketing and brand. So um, I had a friend, Nicole Dubay, who works for CTV. She's the current uh, anchor, but she, we would be at Jen Darrett, who's in the industry, at her house, sitting by the pool every Friday. And I'm like, yeah, I'm starting a business with my partner, Amanda, blah, blah, blah. She's like, I'll get you on TV. So I became this like regular, which now it's not as a brand because it was more like help for your home. Um, and now I think we've transitioned into something different, different, but at the time, oh my gosh, people, you want layers of marketing. So people would see us on TV. They would get the tuxedo magazine. That was one of our main demographics. They would see us out and about. We exploited social media. Oh. Can you guys hear me? Can I just get a thumbs up? I got signed out quickly. Yeah, you can still hear you, Debbie. Okay, brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. I'm like, uh-oh. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> so part of our um, exploration in our uh, business plan too, at the time in 2013, social media in Winnipeg and Manitoba was not really used. So we're like, okay, we're going to exploit this like crazy. So Facebook at the time was our bigger medium. We built a community, even though we didn't have work to show, 
because we didn't have our portfolio, um, which legally you're entitled to have, but we didn't have that to show. We had to basically position ourselves in other creative ways. So it was very much uh, rooted in community engagement, whether it was in inspirational quotes, showing the culture behind the scenes, doing like 3D models, you know, us live at, you know, flooring, showrooms, whatever, and then things like CTV. So we had to get creative of build, building content and touch points. So this is like what our grid looked like back in the day <laughs> because we didn't have a portfolio. I mean, this obviously is a deliberately exaggerated version screenshot, but it was like finished work, not the greatest at the time because, you know, so there's like process work, community, and like my cat. So it showed at the time, this is in 2013, a little screenshot of our Facebook. Whereas today, this is what we're able to show. So now this is our actual work. It was important to us to never just show, oh, inspo image. You know, that's misleading. And that wasn't inherent to us doing it wasn't honest to, to us. Doesn't mean it's not honest for someone else, but we would rather show our behind the scenes and our culture and our voices and get creative and do like, even if it's post rationalized work, it shows our skill set than inspo images and misleading. So that doesn't lead to trust later on. So even like today, we're always engaging with our clients. So we had one little, um, thing in our grid that was funny. It's like, we ended up having our own language, which is part of our shtick. So it was cute, like, um, oh, and I can't even read it because my eyes is terrible, but you can read it and you can see it later. But basically it was languaging that we use. And then it was so funny because clients were popping on and being like, oh my God, I can totally hear you say that. And they it resonated with them because it was like referencing to our experiences with them. And then they're like, you should do this one next time. So it's just different ways that we touch point. It's always, it's not always just about content and sexy finished pictures. Um, sometimes it's like, hey, you, I work with you. Remember, this is how we chat. And it, it pulls the heartstrings. And then another thing that was huge for us, and again, which was a key player when we had no portfolio, as we started to get work, we didn't want to just show the sexy after shots. The dirty behind the scenes, post the shots were huge for us. So since 2013, we've been showing process. We're seeing a lot more of that on social media these days, but from day one, it was something we always did. So that gave us content that made our clients feel special and more involved. And it was also like the community at large, like it was really engaging for them to like buy into, you know, buy into our story and drink the Kool-Aid. So whether it's for collages, this is all the Brock projects. Um, that again, you've seen a lot on social because we're kind of excited about it. And then here's our corporate office. Now, it didn't always look like that. So that's my house. Um, so we're home based. And I think we always will be. Amanda and I and the team, for the most part, it just it supports what we do and how we work. And um, clients love it. It gives us an opportunity now that we've renovated it to show some of our design moves. It's actually better in space. It doesn't translate as well in photography. Um, some of the spaces are tighter, but it, what's nice about it, it also acts as a tool. Like for example, my integrated fridge that you can't see there, it's an expensive detail. It's an expensive investment, but it's something we can show actively, show how we detailed, explain where those hours go and why in the floor plan that was the gesture to do. So it becomes a bit of a live lab. Um, it's just where we're more comfortable at. And don't laugh. This is literally how we engage with our space. So, <laughs> yeah. So, you know, right to left, that's Mike and I doing a design scrum. You know, we just felt like being in the living room that day. And Fluff does Fluff. So he's on Mike's lap, again, to the left. There's Mike just working at the kitchen table, you know, doing some construction drawings. There's Fluff. You know, Natasha, me, and Mel, top right. This was, you know, in the crest of COVID. Um, we're always just in and out. David plugging away. And then me doing what I do best, wearing sweatpants and either being on the floor or the countertop. So, you know, it, it's just nice because we have a really casual platform to do what we do best. And clients like it too. And then our storefront, you know, we don't have a physical space. Well, we have our office, but it's more our website and our social media. That's where we feel most comfortable. 
And then, you know, as we elevated the brand, you know, some of the signature uh, colorways, logo types um, that support our storefront. Yeah, and something also that sits really um, well with us is design creates culture and culture shapes your values and values determine your future. So um, again, like a lot, I've been asked a lot lately, like, what are you most inspired by? And it's people and it's those engagements we have and, uh, and living life. So this really resonates with us and just food for thought. Um, and then in terms of projects, like we have been very referral based, like, oh, I better hurry up. <laughs> Dave just gave us a signal. So a lot of our projects have just been referrals. So it's funny, we call ourselves like design swingers. So there was a time where we were doing lots of restaurants. We got Chosabi, Chosabi referred us to New Burger. New Burger brought us on to Underdogs. Kawhi Crepe talked to the owner of New Burger. We got that project. And then they all knew each other, then Confusion Corner. We've done more restaurants lately, but there was a time where we we're literally just doing all of these. Part of the reason businesses love working with us, and this comes down to what I've gotten the last, is design outcomes are brand and business driven. So our energy is put more towards a, our signature process versus a singular design aesthetic. So we have a process, but at the end of the day, what's your business plan, right? And we're here to guide and elevate that with you. And the project success, success is contingent on these trust bonds and relationship building. So if you don't trust us, we can't get that information from you. Um, and managing expectations, always throughout the process, just not the beginning, people forget, they wanna hear what they wanna hear. So, and bad news is just news. So you have to find your way to deliver it, um, but it's just news. Uh, tighter drawings equal better build out. So we put a lot of time and energy into doing those tight drawings. The more loosey goosey they are, the longer your build out. The longer your build out, they don't open their business. So I remember Kyle from Newberger said, every day that we're not, or every month that we're not open, we're losing 100,000 in revenue. So my drawings, our drawing story should be tight. We need to get them open on timeline. Time is money. And business owners know that we do that. Uh, client base built through word of mouth. So again, word of mouth. So we did all these restaurants and then all of a sudden we did the yoga bar and then became wheelhouse and ignite cycle. So we went through a swing of exercise. Then it was brewery, half pints, little brown jug, low life barn hammer. Now we're doing more little brown jug. Um, and then medical, we did for medical aesthetic. Then city place wanted us. Then one place in Lethbridge. Then another place in Lethbridge. Then Lumi Dental. And now we're working on another dental clinic and academy. So we kind of swing because they're brand specific versus the rest. And then it's all about sincerity, people. So we don't have a recipe for how we combine things. Just be sincere. And in the end, it will str strangely, it will always succeed. I better hurry up. <laughs> okay, and things we know about authenticity, authenticity, energy is contagious. Vulnerability creates trust bonds. So trust bonds are how we get tacit knowledge out of people. It's not the things you can write down, it's the things that you absorb through being around people. Observation, feeling, energy, it's woo woo, but it's true. And people want to work with humans, so be human. <laughs> own your own and know your own. <laughs> Uh, know what you know and know what you don't know and be humble and always ask, be curious and ask questions. So if you don't know, that's okay. Just ask the questions. Uh, check your, your ego at the door. There's no room for that. Um, be real. Being real always attracts like-minded people. And I think that's why we have the clients we have and the outcomes that we do. And you're only as good as the team that you collaborate with. So whether it's internally with our team, like we're literally family and sisters and brothers now. <laughs> Um, and the partners, like the architects and engineers and part clients that we partner with. And so here's us being a bit of a gong show because <laughs> we're just being real. Um, and do you encourage your clients to do the same, make them feel safe. So always lean into your knowing. Life has taught you well. Your life is going to help you do what you do best. So bring your, if you're a server, that's gonna help you with a restaurant job. If you've traveled and you've gone through sticky situations, us as employers wanna know that because you can wiggle, you know, it will translate to your work. Be vulnerable. Keep your mind and your heart open. Again, this is my woo-woo part. So you can deeply observe what and who you are, who are around you. Own your mistakes. They're gonna make you trustworthy and they're gonna make you grow as a designer.
Know your value and advocate it for it always and respectfully. Watch for red flags. They're there and trust your gut. They will rarely mislead you and just respond to them accordingly. Um, chemistry is everything. Be real and encourage those who are around you uh, to engage. Oop, engage with, that's not way to spelling error, we don't. And always read the room. And trust your ability to adapt to the room, but still own your voice. And do what you feel is in your heart to be right, for you'll always be criticized anyways. Thank you, Eleanor Roosevelt. Questions? Thanks, guys. <laughs> Great, thanks so much, Debbie. <laughs> We, we, made, we made it through here and that was, that was very enlightening and it was very encouraging talk as well. And I think you've taken a very unique perspective on this where uh, a lot of um, students often ask um, how to begin their own business or how to kind of get their foot in the door. So it's great to see this from the, the start and then to the, the current. And so what I'd like to do first and foremost is open the uh, discussion. So if anyone has any questions or comments or anything of that nature, feel free to use the emote button to place your hand up. Um, and it'd be great if you could put your camera on while you ask the question. But if not, uh, we also have the chat and then we can uh, I can address any questions on there. Oh, great. We have a question from Carla and I haven't seen Carla in ages. So, Carla, uh, feel free to turn your camera on and uh, and uh, mic off and uh, all that stuff. Hi, guys. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. I'm in the Bay shopping on my lunch hour. Oh my gosh, how brilliant. <laughs> Hi, everyone. You. Hi, um, thanks so much. That was so, that was so great. It was really great to hear all about it. And my question is, how did you get your first customer? Oh my gosh, so who's our first customer? No, oh, actually, I'm gonna talk about two because it's quite interesting. So our first residential customer ended up being my ex-husband's accountant. So again, it was like leaning into community. People just want to support you. So that kind of goes into our being kind always. Like students um, who I've gone to school with, our Jewish community, exes always worked out. So he that was one of our first residential jobs. And then it was interesting on LinkedIn, um, on my personal profile, I had like all my experience that showed like I knew what I was doing, but my voice was refreshing. So mm. it was quirky. It was like me. And so we attracted the investors field group and got our first commercial job, which was in our first month of working, was a million dollar project. And so that was Wade Miller. And he continues to be our client right now. We're doing two buildings right with him right now in an office. So that was for LinkedIn, but again, being very authentic and it was a refreshing point of view and they just drank the Kool-Aid. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm actually about to start that self-employment program. So oh, it was God. great to hear that you did it. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, you're welcome. Awesome. Great question, Carly. Congratulations. Uh, do we have any other questions? We have a few comments that I just want to read out from the chat as well. Tamara Nisola, um, a sessional instructor here, said great pr presentation and thanks you. And Gillis Quarries loves this and loves you guys. And uh, we have Erica Sammons as well, who thanks you for sharing and has found your team always to be inspiring. So lots of questions there, or I guess comments more so. And uh, I do have a kind of a quick question. And so if anyone else does have any, please just raise your hand or write in the chat and I'll gladly um, address those as well. But just to kind of get things started off as well, I, I noticed uh, throughout the presentation, there was a very kind of um, grassroots feel to it all. And I think that that's a very kind of lovely aspect to it. Um, especially with your current position in the market, as you showed how many things you've worked on, you've still kept that. And so the path of the evolution was very clear showing that, you know, elements have remained like the home base and such. But my curiosity is kind of what is the challenges and some of the opportunities that you would uh, say if someone were wanting to do something similar to kind of do things out of a, a home base rather than the typical office format? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, like ours evolves slowly. We, it's funny. It's, quirky as we can be behind the scenes we have so much structure if you saw our file management you'd be like wtf or you know our templates so 
there's certain structural things that are rules, let's call them. So even though this is home-based, we call it corporate because we connect as a group a couple times a week, sometimes once a week. Sometimes if we're all deep diving into hours of construction drawings, we do it from our home in sweatpants. But we've got certain rules that make sure we can connect together and that um, even like virtually is connected. Um, just to be prepared from a technological perspective, um, and I think just, just own it. Honestly, don't be ashamed of it. Own it. Because grassroots, I'm glad you actually said that, because that's actually one of um, our brand words that we never said in this presentation, but we always reference. So I'm really glad that came out. Mm -hmm. And then opportunity-wise, I mean, number one, look what just happened with COVID. <laughs> like, when we had to go virtual, it's like, okay, we do that every day. <laughs> like, it was a no brainer. And then what that's also done even pre COVID is that we've had some successful projects because that virtual strength, when we need it and we don't want to get together, um, it helped us do our partnering work in Lethbridge with Spencer Core, who was like one of my contemporaries at Mellon School. Um, we're doing a house in Colorado. We did a house in Mexico. There's been times we worked on franchises. So all that route is not needed with a corporate office. So it gives you confidence in doing that. That's my tangent answer. I'll accept that tangent answer. <laughs> uh, I think Simrath, did you have your hand up for a moment there? Uh, please let me know if you did have a question. I think I saw it up for a second. Hi, yeah, I had a little question, um, but I think it kind of got answered a little bit. Um, but I'd say, first of all, thank you for your presentation. I really enjoyed hearing your journey. Um, but I guess like my question was more about your design process. Um, and like, I know you mentioned that like construction is hard and I guess like as a student, we're like learning more about that slowly. Um, and like, for example, like the idea of like charrettes and working with different departments to kind of create solutions. So it like eliminates problems in construction phases, but like those are for larger projects. Um, so I guess my question for you would be like, how does your firm work to ensure consistency from your design um, to your construction or like what would you hope to employ in the future? Yeah, I mean, from a continuity perspective, I tapped out on that with my answer to Jason is like the back of house for us, let's call it, is very, very structured. So um, there are certain things in there that we have a lot of continuity for. With it, there's also a baseline of how we employ. Right now, um, David, I would say, is almost junior, and the rest of us have had between six and 18 years experience in the field. Um, and it's just sort of where we're at right now at the pace with two mat leaves and just COVID challenges. We need that for continuity. Um, on every project, we have two designers and typically Amanda's only right now a partner. So myself and or Amanda are on a job partnering with David or I partner with Mel a lot. So there's always two designers on each project. So from a creative perspective, we're constantly scrumming together, making sure that we like the point of view of the project, the concept, the strategy, the challenges we identify. And then what we might do is we separate into our own tasks and we regroup for, you know, redlining and collaboration and critiques. And depending on the project scope, if it's larger, we might pull another, you know, member of the team to support and like, I'm not as good with making collages, but Dave will whip out a brilliant one like mood board that will support it. Um, so that's sort of how we go in and out together as a team, but within that framework. And then we have really good templates for AutoCAD. So even though some projects can have a little bit of a, a narrative that suits the project, because a class A project for a commercial tender is different than you know, a bathroom renovation or even something on the main floor that the builders already brought on board. So that can look a little bit different, but the skeleton comes from our templates. So we make sure our line weights read properly. We make sure our code, our code details are already spelled out. We've got templates for all that. Um, yeah, every paper pages are set up. Um, so we do have that structure to follow, but yeah, collaboration is huge for us. We never want to let go of that studio sort of flavor. Right now we're a little bit stretched because I'm wearing the hats of two partners more actively. And like I said, those projects are coming in. Like we have a wait list until the fall. Um, and some of those projects are becoming a bit more comprehensive. I don't know if I answered the question because I kind of skirted a bit. So <laughs> Oh, let me know if there's more that you want me to expand on. No, that was great. Thank you. Yeah, you jump in too. I'm like, yeah. blah, 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 blah. 
And then Great, thank you very much. So it seems like Sim has accepted the answer. So, so you've done well there, Debbie. Yeah, and I get, I get a thumbs up from her too as well. So I have a few other kind of questions and comments that have just popped up in the chat. Uh, Lindsay Bieberdorf said, great presentation, Debbie. Thank you, and included a smiley face. So that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's always good news. And then I think this is one of your, your, your uh, colleagues here, Natasha Bargan has a uh, somewhat of a, she says a cheesy question, but I don't think it is a cheesy question. It was, uh, it was on my list of, of potential questions as well. And, and it would be, uh, what would you tell your university self knowing what you know now, what to focus on more or about what to worry on less? And I think that's a really great question because we have, I, I see the list quite a few ED4 students and some ED3 students and a few master students as well. So what would you uh, say to that, Debbie? Oh my God, that's a good question because I'm the student that did her two years master's. I was like the guinea pig first year and threw it in the garbage. <laughs> so yeah, um, and it had a bit to do with capacity. You know, you, you get in this rat race internally in school and you want to be the arc star and you want to apply to every scholarship and while you wait, your self-concept gets like sort of pulled into there. Don't take yourself so seriously. You know, and not... I can't believe I'm going to say this. It's not about doing the bare minimum, but at the end of the day, you are the boss of you. You know what's important to you when you do the edit, that filter of what you are. And just make sure you have capacity, which is energy, to take in what's important. So just always do check-ins um, because you can get stretched. I also would tell you not to do all things. <laughs> Sorry, professors that may encourage it, <laughs> but in the real world, like I don't want to hire someone who does all nighters. I want to know that you can meet a directive and be your best form because if you're a disaster meeting the client the next day, you know you're not a good service to me. So find a way to manage your time. And if that even means sometimes not getting that A plus, but you get that A or I don't even know if I should say this, but <laughs> at the end of the day, the bigger picture is what matters more versus the micro. I would, to add to that, um, I know Jason would know my history of all-nighters too, and like pretty much going along with that is just like in during school, I had no work-life balance, like it was just school, that was all that mattered, um, but now like looking back on it, I'm like, oh, I, I would have been okay if I just like went to sleep, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and your projects would have been better. Yeah. And your presentations would have been better. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's yeah, interior designers, yeah, health, safety, and welfare, I think is always something that yeah. we want to, want to be considerate of, whether it be through the through the building or or the individuals themselves. Yeah, it's really honestly it's so important. And so I say that with you know, I, I laugh at it. I don't want to hire someone who thinks who's showing off about that. I want to know about your life, you know. So also while you're in school, go travel if you have the opportunity, go get lost in back lanes, go work at a restaurant, you know, join your gym observe everything you do because ultimately depending on who you want to fit with a designer firm that so you can start building your experiences knowing i want to be more boutique i want to work in this like that's another way to learn and observe and bring to the table like life matters great Take debbie question, natasha <laughs> I, I i think there's there's a lot to think about here and especially um considering this this incredible journey that your your firm has gone on and uh, i i wish you continued success with that debbie but on that note i think we're going to be ending today's discussion here as we're, we're getting close to 1 p.m and i think uh there, there's no further questions or comments but uh, we really appreciate your time today and especially sharing this unique perspective as to how you've kind of approached interior design and how you've approached your career as well and it was really great to see David come join us again. Um, and it's always good to have you come back. So uh, I thank you again. And on that note, we're going to kind of close everything out here. So thank you. And uh, please join us again for our next event. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. It was an honor.